All right, we're ready, Mark. Mark, we're ready. Uh, Are you having trouble unmuting? You should be able to, you're a co-host. Yeah. There we go. I keep on getting muted when I am, that was weird. Um, so let me start again. Welcome to Lip Balm. Um, I believe it's episode 52. Is that right, Jonathan? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, so we're uh, four episodes away from a full year. Um, it has been quite an endeavor, uh, as we all know. Um, anyway, uh, today we have an amazing feature. Um, Poets Connected uh, to Singapore, uh, which includes uh, Alvin Pang, uh, who was our host for the feature, uh, Rachel Blau du Plessis, uh, Ranjit Hoskoti from Bombay, uh, George Sitches uh, from the UK, and Marilyn Tan from Singapore. Uh, Rachel, I, I believe, is coming in from Philadelphia, is that right? Um, and Alvin is in from Singapore as well. So. Thanks so much for coming today. It will be an amazing feature. Um, and let me just uh, sort of move in to the show uh, and introduce my co-host, Jonathan Penton, uh, who founded Unlikely Stories, uh, an electronic journal of literature and art in 1998. Since then, he's lent editorial and management assistance to a number of literary and artistic ventures, such as Mad Hat Inc., the New Orleans Poetry Fest Festival, where we are also today, um, in collaboration with um, Rigorous and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry a year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chap from Virgin Press, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods and Standards of Sidity, uh, which came out in 2016 from Lit Fest Press. And recently, the free e-chat book, Backstories, which you can download from Argotist eBooks. Uh, let's hear something, Jonathan. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, real quick, I wanted to say something about the New Orleans Poetry Festival. You know, we're, we're doing these, um, the show in conjunction with them. And it's a really big deal for them to be able to offer everything free this year. Lip Balm is always free, but um, this year the New Orleans Poetry Fest is free and open to all. And that's thanks to our sponsors, especially the Jazz and Heritage Foundation and the Academy of American Poets. Um, so after this event, if you go to nolapoetry.com, um, it'll show all the events of the New Orleans Poetry Festival. There's something almost every day this month. And yeah, there's, there's lots to look towards to, and you can see the next two lit bombs listed and described there as well. All right, so I've been writing, um, I've been writing at Crestus pieces about the sculptures in the New Orleans Sculpture Garden, and I'd like to read one of those. I read this at the New Orleans Poetry Festival open mic. I don't believe I've ever read it for Lit Balm, and if I have, tough. All right, this is based on a sculpture, Traveling Light by Alison Saar. My black wife and I went to a gallery opening. The exhibit was a mix of painted photographs and mixed media sculptures on the subject of the lynching of black southerners. The artist was a white man and he was attempting to explain his work to two other white men as well as educate them on the source material and events. The two observers were agitated and aroused, thrilled to be there, opening night for such an important exhibit. They said that the subject was painfully heavy but they found it cathartic as well. My wife did not sleep that night. This sculpture is a man hanging from a rope. He is upside down. He is hanging from his feet. His head is hollow. His head is a bell. The clapper had to be removed from the skull so that people would stop ringing it. This is what I know. All right, it's my great pleasure to introduce another one of our co-hosts, Cassandra Atherton. Cassandra is who's, who's dialing in from Australia where it's very early in the morning, but it's actually morning unlike in Bombay and Singapore. Um, Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers and Fugitive Letters. 
She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, and Introduction, and the Aus Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Cassandra, will you read us a poem today? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna read a short prose poem because I only write prose poems. This is a short one. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of the artists invited to the Venice Biennale. And so we did a wonderful exhibition of poetry um, on some of the famous Italian and Venetian poets like uh, Veronica Franco. So this one's called Volcano. In the cooling aftermath, I become glassy rock my fingers covering the last place you kissed me, sparing it from destruction. Once I occupied the spaces between your ribs, dwelt in the thick absences between embraces, but broken language ignited a fire that marched beneath my skin. I am more than your pilot light. I am subtle as a volcano. When you find me, there's a pocket of hot air beneath my igneous palm. So I would like to uh, introduce the intrepid Mark Vincennes, who is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, a translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and musician. He's published 14 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. Vincenza's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Desires, and a novella set in ancient China, Three Towers of Tao, or How to Catch a Fortuitous Elephant, are both forthcoming in 2021 from Spite and Dival. An album of music, ambient, and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is also forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenzi is also a prolific translator, and he's translated from German, Romanian, and French. He's published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Matz with White Pine, and which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Matz's selected poems, An Audible Blue, is forthcoming from White Pine Press. His poems have been published in many journals. You've heard them all from The Nation, Plowshares, The Los Angeles Review, World Literature Today, Raritan, Asymptote and Plume. His work has received fellowships and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the Literary Colloquium Berlin, the National Endowment for the Arts and the Witte Brinner Foundation for Poetry. Vincennes is editor and publisher of the Sparkling Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain, and where there are more beavers, bobcats, and woodchucks than people. Mark, can you read from your amazing Irv forest this, this morning in Australia? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Cassandra. From this evening in Western Massachusetts, um, and this poem uh, comes from a new book I'm working on called Coalition. All the steel. All the steel was needed for propping up the world, all smelting in our furnaces, all hand cast, teased into the edges and bevels we all know so well. It was said in our foundry, a lone bat lived in the eaves, a giant fruit bat who drove, dove for mangoes and apple stalks after the second shift in the third quarter, after the decommissioning of workshop number 45, stainless steel. Stainless steel was no longer called for in the decomposing age. It had to rust, to flounder and flake under the weight of years. It had to brown and gray. It had to get under your fingernails like the bugs we found in our bed. They were funny, those little segmented raisins scattering from the wall to corridor and they'd let you take them in your, in, in your hand. And they ran patterns of eight and zero. Zero was my favorite. I always bet on the zero. Infinity was more your piece of toast. And part two, handcrafted is the approach we want to take, said the manager in workshop 42. His glasses were skew and looked like they might slip off his face. His hair was full of grease and his khaki tie was a shade of slate at best. His mouth pursed together as he spoke 
and one of his eyes quivered, but he was known to string together the best folk. He had a chain around his neck as a reminder of what might have been. Every second link had a thorn. He eyed the crowd, gathered round his podium, then pointed at me. Tell me, citizen, how do we feed the fire? I beamed, stood square, and shouted out, as the blessed Lord may please, with shards of the soul. May the soul feed the fire. May the fire feed the soul, shouted the manager. May the fire feed the soul, cheered the workers. You have to know, he said, we were brought onto this planet for a purpose, for the pain of it, not for your iridescent smile. The workers applauded, tapped their chests, swept back their hair. They knew everything lay in their own hands. And for that, they were grateful. And now, let me segue into the feature section of our show and I'm going to hand over the mic to Alvin Pang to introduce his guests. Thank you so much for being with us, Alvin. Hi, everyone. I guess it's my turn now. Um, my name's Alvin Pang. I'm a poet and editor from Singapore. I've done work all around the world, which is, which is where I've had the privilege to encounter many, many fine poets, uh, including the ones that I've brought along here today. So let me first explain uh, the connection between all of us. Well, essentially, they're all friends of mine. Uh, and all the fine poets here are writers I admire greatly uh, in all kinds of ways. And some of them I've, I've encountered in terms of their work before I met them. But they all happen to have come to Singapore at some point or other and spent a bit of time either at the Writers Festival or at the local universities doing residencies, so on and so forth. And we've had a chance uh, to interact and hang out a little bit and talk about writing. Um, well, so we have Marilyn and I'll introduce them as, as they read. So we have Marilyn uh, Ranjit over from India, George again over from the UK and Rachel from Philadelphia. And I thought we would go in that sequence, moving from East to West as it were uh, starting with the 5 a.m. people, that's, that's us in Singapore, uh, moving over to India and then, and then the UK and ending, ending in Philadelphia, which is, I suppose, closer to where you are uh, than we are. <laughs> uh, just a very quick preview. Uh, Singapore, for a very small place um, out in the boondocks of Southeast Asia, as it were, has an incredibly lively poetry scene and has had one since for the last say 20, 30 years, uh, since my generation came along, I like to say. And uh, in fact, this month in April, there is this Facebook community group, some 6,000 poets writing a poem a day uh, in this Facebook group we call Singapore Rhymo, Singapore Poetry Writing Month. And of course, you know, it, it sort of plays off some of the movements that have taken place in the US National Novel Writing Month, so on and so forth. Um, and it's been going on for quite a few years now. And every year, thousands of poems get generated out of this community. Uh, and it, it feeds into what has become a very lively reading scene and writing scene here in Singapore, uh, in English, as well as many other languages that we have here. And uh, it, it, just, it just feeds the fire, as it were, in a way that's, that's really quite lively. Um, so maybe to give us a bit of a taste of uh, the very uh, dynamic community of poets coming out of Singapore in recent years. We have Marilyn Tan. Uh, she's a linguistics graduate, poet, artist, interested in conditions of alienation and marginalization. She has performed at the Singapore Biennale, Singapore Writers' Festival, among other events, and she's founded an arts collective, Discontent, and her writing has, fe has been featured in various print anthologies. Now, her first collection, her debut collection, Gaze Back, won the Singapore Literature Prize last year for poetry in English. And she was, to our shame, the very first woman to have won the prize. Uh, thank you once again for having me curate this show and for having us with you. 
Uh, but please join me in welcoming Marilyn Tan. Hi, thanks so much. Um, now that you've said that, I feel like I'm obliged to read from the book, but I will not. Um, instead, I'm going to be reading some new poems. And these were actually, some of them were actually from last year's uh, Singapore Raimo. Um, but, you know, like every year they, they give up prompts and every year I ignore them. So this is part of um, my, I guess, grappling, you know, when we were in the thick of the pandemic last year about um, Catholicism and, and loss and, you know, struggling with, I guess, um, personal loss and, and the bigger overarching sense of like mortality hanging over our heads. So this is called a wet crimson bushel of pears. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love, Song of Solomon, um, from the King James Version, and also American Gods, Neil Gaiman. Perhaps scatter the scarred breadcrumbs far and few between, and the trail will seem shorter. Every day is a desert, waylaid in the back of my throat. Prickly pair me into sustenance, this body is betrayal. Look at these protesting joints. My one weeping eye. These allergies swelling my voice shut. I think often about taking a long trek on short notice, maybe. I wouldn't like the sand much, but I'd find it easier to be there. Unhampered the moon, unhinged the coyotes, all those wayward symbols of death. Buzzards, not so easy, made corporeal, gifts given short shrift. When we get everything we want, which is now, the first thing, embroiled in happenstance and the brilliance of firelight, stoking menace. Find me a perfect stone upon which to rest my head. No other crutch, smooth, just as wisdom is a wine, milky battered, and perhaps sheltering a serpent. We come here to bleach our bones in unerring light, such that everything crumbles. Return to me, various heaving heavinesses, spilt salt across, a dark stain spreads. Under the single-minded glaring eye of Horus, I don't dare bring my feeble doubts, no longer the pacing, only the being, still a feat. And this one is called um, A Prince with His Gloved Fingers Over an ov Open Mouth Chalice on the Cut Glass Sand. So um, it's from it's from the same series. So I basically just, um, I started writing a poem a day in April of last year, and then I just didn't stop because I was so deep into the, uh, I guess, the poetry is therapy route. Cutting and running on the grapevine, we here to scythe the sick flesh from the bones. No, the glamour swallows itself, the intrigue of farce, to strip away the illusion. Now just me and wrenching gut, you guilt lilt backwards through cornerstones of my youth, placing a finger on the peak of each dark pulsing head of suit, a prickly pear in the lilac dusk, strewing nourishment from a decaying fish head entombed under her roots. Hello, it's me. I have no mouth and I must feed. My raw stone gaze, a proclamation of destination. No, I've driven spikes into the dirt here and here to mark the stigmata blooming across my time to mark the path of an unguarded blot paper sun acid streaking across the sky like a single name they can't keep out of their filthy mouths. No, 
a ring around the perimeter, endless rosaries scattering swarm-like out the corner of my lighthouse, hope showing away insistent anchors, the salt peter sprinkled on your fetid corpse, the worms chorusing like rippling river rushes over your eye sockets, the frigid incarnality of preserved flesh, why they call thin skines of redder than red meat cured. Still I, wrapped in cobalt, born on the talons of those they call Thunderbird, cradling the open mouth of an emerald crusted chalice that sings the body erotic in a desert with no dunes. My throat an amniotic amenoid, I can call back anything like a conch shell to the lips, dripping whole lotuses like forgiveness. One insufferable Oscar Wilde moment arising python from the baked sand, grinning with knowledge as serpents do. It's time to let the sting of clarity lead us by our third eyes now. My chakra is so wide you could drive a ship through them. When I was little, I wanted to be a swamp witch, to still hold holy the sweet sick rot brimming with quiet life, the sinking of toes into mud. Thanks. And um, do I still have time? Like, is there, is there still time to read one more? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to do um, a, a few, like they're really short poems. And this was part of um, a performance called Quilt, like Q-U-I-L-T. And um, it was about the body as safe space and how queer bodies um, find home in in physical spaces and in psychological spaces and this came in the wake of um this performance was was i guess derived from um a, f a furor that happened locally where uh, a trans student was uh, made to i guess um be expelled on the basis of the fact that she uh, would not fit into um the the male uniform because of you know um, hormone replacement therapy and her, her changing body and um, the authorities in Singapore aren't really, um, I guess, primed or to deal with these things um, in in a man in a manner that's sensitive or even humane, right? So even in the press release, uh, they were talking about, you know, um, how um, the student, like the student body and the 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 school authorities that were, were dealing with it had a duty of care to the students and they misgendered the student involved throughout. Um, so this incident was protested and, um, you know, in Singapore, we have a, a law against protest. And basically what happened was after 20 minutes outside the Ministry of Education, uh, the police came and they, they arrested all of these um, activists and they took them in. They were just standing there. They weren't, you know, they weren't being rowdy. They were like, four of them so you know a huge threat to the to the institution anyway so here are three poems about that and um being safe in general the correct way to say well i can don't she says, I have a son, the stranger on the train. It's blessed and packed like protection is something someone else gives you. Like a warning, streamed kiss in the gnarly packed foam. My tongue and teeth seen Snow City handing out postcards at a climate change rally. My little hands holding up a vanguard sheet outside your elite institutions. A wonder child. Always the favorite until no one's the favorite. I always wanted my mouth sewn shut like a primrose of something better. Something grotesque like butterfly body bursting out of its uniform like cocoon, my glistening, swallowing, load-bearing throat. Oh, my silence will not protect me. My silence will not protect me. My silence will not protect me. But it sure might not get me sent in for questioning. Toss my delinquent hair, ikan kuning, and turpentine moss. 
mimify state violence, tell me to apply for permit for my pain, galaxy brain, my future, tell him to salute me, not sand down, tell them to put their might where their money is, their mouth where their money is, their mealy mouthed miserliness. How many bodies, how many cowards, Lacing the wet fingers of my meat flesh through yours. Have nothing like fresh fruits to bear and treating nothing like fresh fruits. Empty my chalices of making it all worthwhile. I hoped this time came cleanly picked off the bone. Show me your wagon, darling, please. Let me hitch my shell to yours. Like a hamster scruffs its wheel like insanity holds the promise of redemption we skinless barefield a survey of warmth and crisscrossed menace i utterly pray defenseless choking goldfish on the floor bobo in my childhood home my parents had a gorilla i hated and then loved. I was terrified of him watching me. My mother would tell me he was watching me. Bobo is watching you, she would say in a sing-song voice. I couldn't bear it. Him, larger than life, perched atop a wardrobe, head brushing the ceiling. I realized Bobo, his name was Bobo, was softer than soft. I learned to curl up in an embrace now too small to hold the entirety of my adult body. And the last one, defenselessness. When will we, perennial question, make that a mark and I'm the grifter. I couldn't grift anything at all if I tried. I was never going to be able to sell you anything you didn't already intend to buy. So many scales fallen like fishmongers glitter. I tried to remember and all I found was a wince. Intimacy is caddisfly corpses all decked out in jewelry and forgetting your own name lying down in a beautiful sarcophagus of your own making. Do you know the parasite control drug revolution? It creates a revolution by pausing the life cycle of the flea, tick, mite, whatever, while it's still cocooned in a bag of soup that's just a primordial soup forever and perhaps forever safe, never to emerge. Is that comfortable? Is that real safety? Is that good for you? Are my fingers too cold? Is anything safe, real? Butterflies retain their memories from when they were caterpillars, which means at some point they were soup and the soup remembered. I can't promise you anything, not even this. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Marilyn Tan. Thanks very much, Marilyn. And thanks for, for getting up uh, with us at 5 a.m. To, to do this. Yay. All right. Um, our next reader um, may be the most recent poet I ever met. I, I met in person, believe it or not, uh, before this whole thing came down upon all of us and shot all our festivals. Oh, well, Cassandra, I met. But of the, of, of the four poets here, I think I met him most recently in person. Uh, Rajat Hoskote uh, is based in Bombay. He's a poet, translator, cultural theorist, and curator uh, who has had eight collections of poetry, including Jonah Whale, uh, Penguin 2018, The Atlas of Lost Belief, Arc Books 2020, and the most recent Hunch Prose, also from Penguin, which I'm trying to get my hands on. Um, his translation of a celebrated 14th century Kashmiri woman mystics poetry has appeared as I Lala, uh, the poems of Lai Deep from Penguin, 
And he's also a major player in the visual arts world. Uh, he curated India's first ever Venice Biennale Pavilion in 2011, and has gone on to co-curate um, major contemporary and trans-historical exhibitions in India and elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ranjit Poskati. Thanks Yay. so much. Thank you, Alvin. It's really a pleasure to be here and to, uh, you know, to have the sense of, of uh, connection and community despite the very strange and disorienting times that we're living through. And uh, so when Alvin invited me to take part in this reading, I thought to myself, you know, the thing that connects Singapore and Bombay is the fact that we're both island cities. And um, today we're all islands, right? We're isolated and the etymology of that word, as we all know, comes from insular. Uh, we're all stuck on our own islands and we're trying to see how we might turn into archipelagos. So that's essentially where I'm coming from to this. So what I thought I'd do is to uh, read from, I have to try and figure out how to hold this up. There we are, yes. <laughs> That's the new book, Hunch Prose. So I'm gonna read a few poems from the book and then I'll read a few new poems if I may. So let me begin with a poem called Haji Ali, which is, uh, it's a Sufi shrine on a tidal island off the coast of Bombay. And uh, that entire uh, situation is now being destroyed by a terrible thing that the government calls the coastal road. So what we see here is this beautiful shrine, which is a confluential uh, uh, trans, trans, it's a non-sectarian kind of shrine. And it's being overpowered and overwhelmed by this pointless infrastructure project. So in a sense, this poem is about trying to think about what this uh, shrine meant to many of us who grew up in this city. Haji Ali, it goes like this. You wouldn't remember me. I came and went like rain out of season. At Haji Ali, the stoplights changed without recording my passage. I stumbled along the beach, the sea snapping at my heels. Guardian angel of the weather, with one wing broken. I couldn't stop summer when it prowled and roared in streets that should have been flooded. Every screen in every movie hall was set to zero or lower. I couldn't push back the tide when it washed over the narrow road pointing to the saint's island. All I could do when I left was to gather up and carry every one of your boats away. They're riding at anchor in this song you've been trying to remember. In the, in, in the, in, in the year that I spent writing this book, uh, I was also caught up as many, many of us in India have been caught up with the deterioration of our, of our public sphere, the rise of uh, extremely aggressive ethnocentric uh, fascist ascendancy. So if some of these poems are about trying to hold on to uh, an older cosmopolitan, more inclusive way of being, and if some of them are elegiac, that's one of the reasons why. This one's called Hawk. Caught up, on the wave of the past, a hawk scurls back, ripping the seamed and sutured scar of our passage. Its wings are lined with scripts no one can read, but everyone brawls over in the city of howling dogs and winning saints. The blood that spurts under its claws is common, the sort you could smell anywhere, the sort you can smell everywhere. Suffer us all, dear God of many names, to come together and feed ourselves to that insatiable beak. This one's called Town. In this town, 
ask for directions in whispers. Tell no one your birth name. Say you're on your way to nightfall. Buy more bread than you'll eat. Read the signboards forwards and back. Mimic the rare songbird hiding in a bush. Stride along the pipeline bridging the creek. Shuffle off the linen strap on the Kevlar. Play infidel on the hill, believer on the beach. Because one blue is so much closer to us than the other on your knees in the sand. And when it's time, pray you'll come back as pearl thread surf, not driftwood in this town. Half moon. Who could have told a red string from a black string at that hour when half the moon came off in our hands, leaving the other half to drift towards daybreak? Half a moon, you laughed, is better than no bread. Grains of moonlight sieved through a chalk haze scattered across the bay. What is it leaves water behind, uncalculated, emptied of wind rasp song and even the bird that had promised to call out to the first rain clouds? What is it escapes while barges come apart at the seams and sailors skate across iron water to tie blood knots in dragged sand? And I thought I'd now read a few new poems, which were written essentially during this uh, lockdown that, that we've had here. Uh, Alvin, how am I doing for time? You're fine, you're fine. Okay, super. This one's called Eclipse. You waited all night for the eclipse. A panther loped down to the lake and swallowed the moon. Another night, you thought the wind had called for truce. The moon never crossed the laterite border. A third night, searching in this field where the sky had rained stars, you found the moon buried in a furrow that a yoked bull had measured in loops from left to right to left, turning and returning, speak, lunatic angel, which was the right way? Was I implement or impediment? All night, the eclipse waited for you. This one's called Runner. The rain never lies. It just shifts the names of our seasons. Deaf Runner, it's time to outdistance your tribe. Warm your compass on the ring of fire in a fogged kitchen. Write a history of the sky as a steeplechase. Never be that man with a diamond pressed into his forehead who gets on the S-barn with a quiver full of arrows or cycles into a broad river without getting a good look at the shore lights. Lying among dead owls and cardinals, he makes signals in shallow water. Save me, he mouths as the tide marks dissolve from myself. And two more. This one's called Juggler. You need help standing at attention. Knapsack on back on wave thumped turf. You've got this far at first light, undeciphered time. You're ready to start. Take it as it comes, Juggler. Look in the spice grinder's vat. Mind your tricorn head. Here comes the iron thump, watch it jump, spar with prime numbers, enter the castle through a loophole, climb to the top of the horseman's tower, listen to the light rain on the terrace. If tigers could cry, time to call back your powers, pounce on saint blessed cambric, rivers traded for silver, 
dormant ammonite look up for what comes next. Thank you. And the last one I'll read is called tacit, as in the, the, the notation in music. Tacit. She stood under a drizzle of copper leaves, mouth opened in a hymn of praise, voice tacit, only the chirping of sparrows heard on the terrace above the sleeping town. Be opaque, her sisters had said, because this crust is what will get you through. Standing above the chasm opened in the eastern rock, she thought, what if there was no border between flesh and light? What if I had no skin? Of what am I the barometer? Thank you for your attention. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Ranjit Hoskote. Thank you. Uh, Ranjit, thank you again for that. Um, your work is such a reminder to us. Uh, again that you know at this time of COVID when COVID's troubling we human beings um, our histories continue our contentions uh, continue our dereliction of duty to the world continues but there is still the opportunity I think and perhaps even the obligation uh, to return to a, a listening to each other um, to the environment around us uh, there is still a richness that that we can tap on and perhaps uh, return to an attention of, and and your work just really calls us back to that, to that listening in a profound way. So, so thanks for that, and just loving the new work. I'm trying to get my hands on on Hunch Prose's new book, but because it's published in India, I'm trying to pull a few strings to get a, to get to get copies, not just my own, but to get that work out to our communities. And one of the things we can do here together. Uh, is to remember that poetry is a universe out there. Um, it is very local, we know that. Uh, poetry is a very local thing, but it is much more than local. And, and there are ways in which it can connect us through events like this, but also finding ways to you know, read each other's books, find each other's work, and really talk about how we can do more of these things together. And, and, and I'm hoping you're ex excited as me as, as, you know, to find ways to do that. Next reader um, is a dear friend and a distinguished poet uh, with 12 books of poems, including Real, which won the T.S. Eliot Prize uh, in 2004. And he's since been shortlisted for several uh, other books since. His latest is, uh, well, his latest in the bio is Mapping the Delta. So is uh, over here. Um, and his memoir, The Photographer at 16, which is a memoir uh, of his mother, was awarded the James Tate Prize, James Tate Black Prize in 2020. Now, uh, very recently, he and I have been working on a collaboration of uh, writing poems back and forth to each other about our response to COVID, our situation in COVID. Essentially, it's, it's almost like writing letters through poems to each other about about where we are in ourselves and in the world as this thing happens to us. And it started as part of a project um, called Poetry and COVID run out of the University of Plymouth. A book has come out of that project as well, including some of our collaborative work, which we might read a little bit of today. Oh, you've got a copy. Yeah, there you go, George. I haven't got my copy yet. <laughs> and. Um, to tell you more about it and to perhaps talk about his most recent work, please join me in welcoming George Surtees. Thank you very, very much, Alvin, and thank you for the lovely invitation. It's always a humbling and very powerful experience to be reading with fellow poets. Um, yes, the original project was suggested by the editors of that anthology. And we have essentially been batting poems to and fro in various different forms, picking up from each other. This selection that we're reading from here is actually the selection in that book, but, this, but our collaboration 
goes before and after it, in fact, still continues. We're on some kind of journey and we're, we'll be very interested to see where we end. We hope it will end in a book of its own. But I will begin and then we'll alternate. We sigh the word again, as if it were a new thing, like rediscovering grain, an endless reckoning with our sense of ending. We are waiting for the train to arrive before it has left. We're singing the refrain while music comes adrift and trains refuse to shift. We think to breathe and weigh the sunlight as it falls on grass swept through the day by wind like distant bells or anything that tolls. Dear friend, the words between the silence rearrange the various shades of green, though nothing seems to change, so even grass is strange. Nothing seems to change and nothing seems to move. The heart ebbs out of range. It craves a sea to love, but all there is is groove and tolerable drain and mud raked over coals for heat. But still we strain to sing, to brave the shoals. The minutes claim their tolls, the hours pay their keep. The tables turn and plead for unreserved sleep. The still extracts a fee. Free time is never free. Old Leonard had it right that everything is cracked. I had to slough my sight to gain this smarting fact. Each day I cannot act is one for feet astray, misspent, a page turned. But what is there to say with time? What earned and to what blind end? This rhyme is delay. We are only delaying autumn, not cancelling it. Autumn will not be postponed, or not for long. Leaves that are preparing to fall will reconsider their position and will make a statement in due course. Birds have continued to mate and the rate of egg production has not fallen, nor have the leaves. Birds' wings continue to beat. The position with hearts is equally assuring. They too continue to beat and have not been cancelled, though some may experience an inevitable delay. This is the language, and these are the terms in which we negotiate delay and postponement. Be assured that nothing has been cancelled. Our punctuation is in place, grammar is on our side. So now there is only autumn to prepare for. I'm thinking how here we reckoned our days without the season's clock, pendulous fall, winter's white talk. I suppose what we do is carry on until caught invariably by surprise, May's loud heat, December's lush skies, Today, an unseasonable gloom has thrilled an afternoon, a year-end storm come much too soon. Heaven reduced to a waiting room, a Ragnarok thrum, the ball of a jet, is August but not September yet. The schoolward course is test-bound, rung-stepped, an almanac of hoops, the financial year implacable, loops onto itself finds us but is never found wanting. Another while, another clinical scan, man hands worriment to man in a sealed plain envelope. Dental visits, barber stops. We take circling as certainty of line, break as mark of headway, of hope that things pass, that passing might be passable, welcome, light. What is it to come to an end? It is not this stream of words with its arbitrary stops and hesitations. That could go on forever, or whatever forever means. 
There is no doubt that sentences exist and that lines end because we make them end. Listen to the drip and drawl, the drudgery of it, the gripe and growl of it as it passes through time. The clothes on a line are in high spirits like can-can dancers kicking up their legs. The clouds muse on them and withdraw into ever deeper recesses of contemplation. My tongue is sore with speaking. My throat is dry. I trudge through endless deserts of syntax to arrive at this wordless, deserted fort where some foreign legion briefly fetched up and entered memory through the back door of film. There was no dialogue then, only film waiting for a soundtrack or its version of Cut Up, Time's our own fan fiction, where we built a fort out of whatever it affords, its walls of syntax crumbling. We joked about it, admired its dry humour and its thirst for contemplation. We said we'd spend night there and then withdraw into a sense of the local on its own last legs. What are we then? Sentences? or spirits? What happened to us? What drags us through time with its own limited versions of growl and cry? Listen again. Do you hear it now? The drip, drip, drip of water seeking its own vessels and an end to waiting. There is no certainty without doubt and doubt, no doubt, could carry on forever. Let's imagine here is where it stops, here, in mid-sentence, or a place like this. Why do we sentence ourselves to this refusal of silence, these beats of idle fingers upon the wall of a page? I come back to this. Sometimes one world thins enough to hear another, the faintest echo of what might yet be, or what perhaps is elsewhere. A life we can't touch, yet half remember. A second movement, a next, a continuing. An ear pressed against the shadows of cinemas and churches, asleep to its own slumber. Leave the boy be, muttering to unseen spirits, his black tussled hair graying in the skittish light, dreaming of waking, his palms clutching air as at the thread of a song leading him homeward. The music made in being, being with, knowing as a kind of end. What news of the world? From my part of the country, the wind and the sea. And what news in yours? Just dark clouds growing darker and the sound of things falling. Falling far? As if forever and time slowly retreating, then there is still time. So, that's yeah, that's it for the published part of our collaboration. Thank you. And uh, maybe George will uh, read us some of his other uh, recent work as well. Do you have uh, any more time? Oh, I don't want to take other people's time. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 so Cassandra, we do have time, right? Yeah, absolutely. If there's always time for George, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you two or three little things from a forthcoming book, which is forthcoming in October? It's called uh, Fresh Out of the Sky, the book. But at the end, it consists of four or five parts. And at the end of it, um, it's, it's a kind of collection of a best theory which is partly based upon Apollinaire and partly based upon <coughs> Sutherland, a painter. Um, and I'll read you for him. What did happen is so you got a rhymed quatrain, then you got a prose piece. So it's rhymed quatrains, prose all the time. The prose piece has its own little crazy logic. So this is stag beetle. Horned demon, stag beetle, half insect, half Swiss army knife. Your armor seems impregnable. Have you come to take my life? I have lived among insects all my life, he said, handing me a stag beetle. It was a magnificent specimen, 
a martial object equipped for both defensive and offensive operations. When propped up at 45 degrees, it suggested a Renaissance nightmare, the perfect rejection of humanism. But now, in my palm, it simply sat like a philosophical problem. But there would be a solution, he said. There would be lots of solutions. This is Owl. Let me versify you into life in your oil skin coat with your outspread toes. I want to feel you leap right through my chest like phlegm in my mouth and nose. Between wall and fence, in a puddle of its own, the toad squatted. It must have been about important business because it barely noticed me and did not look up at my approach. You will have to sit down and wait your turn. I can't do everything at once, it eventually remarked. So saying, it leapt into my open mouth and began to dictate affairs. It was only when I sneezed that it politely made its exit and settled back into a damp pocket of the universe. I'll read you one more and then I'll end there. This is Chauve-Souris, which actually just means a bat. More trace than body, more dusk than night. Nothing like bird or a mouse in your address. I imagine a huge hand crushing you into a speck, infinitely more or less. The bat had flown in through the window and was now tangled in open curtains. The city lay below us with a sleeping river. The domes and spires of the prevalent religion next to the great juggernauts of commerce, all its nightlife crawling down the street or scurrying along like defenseless mice. It was then the bat cried out and the curtains began to flap. The bat was still struggling. It was like an apple core with leathern wings. Leathern was a word we had found in the guidebook, appropriate for just such occasions. One of 12 or so, or I'll stop there. And thank you very much for um, listening to me. Thank you again, George. It's it's always, always such a pleasure to, to be in the same room as George, whether for poetry or whiskey or all of them at once, really. Why not? Let, let's get into the same real room with real whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> um, you're, you're, you're definitely on my list of first people to visit when that becomes possible, George. Oh, so do save come. me a seat at the table. Um, oh, I miss you all. Yeah. And and um, over to the U.S. now um, to Philadelphia with Rachel Blau de Plessis, yay! Um, the author of the multi-volume long poem Drafts, written between 1986 and uh, 2012. This is one of many volumes. If Zoom will let us see it, and uh, the book of collage poems Numbers showed you earlier, and graphic novella in 2015, um, 2015 book. Her second long poem, which I believe is ongoing, uh, called Traces, with days, days and works, late work, uh, around the, work, the day in 80 worlds and other components to come. Uh, the most recent volume of which is, I believe, Poetic Realism. She flashed us the book earlier. She has written extensively on gender, poetry, and poetics. Uh, in volumes such as The Pink Guitar, Blue Studios, and Purple Passages. And she's edited the Selected Letters, selected letters of George Open. Uh, her selected poems, 1980 to 2020, will be forthcoming from Chax in 2022. Please join me in welcoming the fabulous, distinguished, <laughs> um, and amazing Rachel Blau to Plessis. 
Take it away, Rachel. The, the problem with those introductions is what happens if I'm not so fabulous? You know, you can't really count on it. Okay. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. I, I'm going to read. Um, <laughs> The first thing I'm going to read is the title poem from Poetic Realism, because for two reasons. One is that it was written in foreboding, and the foreboding didn't have an end in sight, but except for living in the US during a certain four years that I could mention. Um, but the foreboding ends in this poem with a little reminiscence for not a foreboding reason of being a foreigner in Singapore for uh, just a couple of months. So you'll forgive me um, for the, the, the ending um, if you don't like appropriation of certain kinds. Poetic realism. I began this in a driving snowstorm so I couldn't see the reality of things. Or was the white foggy danger in front of this poem actually the reality of things? The idea of making elegies for unwritten poems, I attribute to the eight inches already fallen and being faced with sodden home time. Effaced means just that. Who knew what she then looked like? Who knew her thoughts ending? I couldn't see out since both outside and in had shadows and crystals of lumped up shapes. I couldn't see in me either. What is a pronoun like he, she, it, they, we, and I, each with tracks of all of them inside each, pocketed and stamped on various organs, memories, and arteries, some kind of blood type living off the viral air of each and brought to each via pipelines, nets, and statements of hope, exchanges and extrusions, splaying through a dramatic group of colorful supernumeraries. Really? Does what count to substitute for a noun, for all nouns, for all unknowns, including I? Two, that was one obviously, which I didn't say. Two, so now, begin today, to date, total. Will this be the day, May 14th, 2018, of the beginning of the end of the world or even of the current world? Generally, it's two decades into any century when the character of the whole begins to be defined or freezes or gets wrapped like death or sweats, some straight jacket mummy shroud that the rest of the decades spend all their collective energy untying the tabs, chains, bindings, and unreachable buckles of. Is May 14th? 2018 going to be this day, circa, give or take a few days, or you know, years. I'm haunted by these further future days. How can I make a book of future days, of days within more days and of oblique silences? What have I come to this portal to tell you? Three. And now both days are now the past and now another day. What is today's haunt? Can it be written? In transit, flat packed sand mud airports are better for takeoff and landing, but flood easily. Another, La in Singapore being situational, emphatic, not my idiom, cozy and ironic at once. Try it, La. Try it, La. Nothing like this says it enough. For I see storms coming through this misted heat, through the foggy cold. I saw, but did not understand those days and other days I apprehended, not yet to be told. That was written before COVID. Just, I'm saying that as, you know, incidentally. 
and then as a kind of um, a filler between poems, I'd like to read the first only stanza of Incomplete Enlightenment, which could have a million stanzas really given everything in Complete Enlightenment. Um, but I just am gonna do the first because I'm rather fond of it. One. The knife was raised before there was an after. He cried, stop, stop. My name means laughter. But a darling boy, no one said that laughter comes only from joy. It could be bitter, sardonic, dry, a snort of knowing irony before the drop was the reply. Anyway, the, the final poem I'll read, and this is because they, they, they kind of get a little longer than some people's poems, is late work. And it is in five sections. There's actually, I suppose, a little bit of what I learned in Singapore, which is that Asian um, elements have are, are five, and the fifth stanza has five uh, mentions of five elements. Late work. One. We meant what we said when we said we were running after language as if we could never catch up. It was so fast and the ground so distracting. So now what? We're older. Can we afford now to stop running? Or must we make time even faster, faster? What is the answer? Look under storms or even ask the dead, since we are closer. Two, are you crazy? Necromancy is forbidden. This to be said sternly and panicked, given the temptations of rolling dice, casting sorts, reading cards, drawing lots, scoping stars, for who? faced with the future, would not would choose not to try a little something. Crystals at the ready, even the charms of a charm chanted to the zodiac. Is late work enraged or is it pensive? Is late work the same or is it different? Is late work fulfilled, frustrated, fusty, grateful? unreasonable, sickened, or akimbo. Late work has no time to spare, breaks into torment, no care for wounding, only making. Late work cannot heal, rips asunder. Late work beyond, late work under, late work, fate work, late work, fate work. Three. The dead awaiting these visitors ready their workshop, plane themselves down. We touch their curly wood shavings fondly, sniff that resiny smell. Ugh, too much. Four. Thus rebuffed, some of them sink, sulk plum-like in small places, stuffed singholes amid a whistling sound. Others find the liminal shunt and otter hold on collapsed distance and flush back and forth through the pipeline, blowing intensely like curtains in a beach house, chatty and self-centered as ever. Amplification is their middle name. They want to tell you more than you can ever figure out or figure in. Do I know you? You seem familiar, they say, while tangential wandering lights flicker and spin. Plus, regrets in patois, sententious, particularistic, every third word unhearable, mumbled in different directions. They're swiveling their heads right around. 
often they come back younger, which considering the condition they left in is all to the good, unless they died unanswerably young. Five, earth, air, wood, luminosity. So now I look to draw some water. The faucets loose, the screws stripped, valve unfixable, pressure down to trickle. This whole system needs a wrench. Late work, I think we're on our own now. That's what I was going to read. Um, if there's any more time, I'll read another kind of Singapore-y thing. What do you think, Alan, you wanna, this is- I, I, I'm gonna <laughs> insist on it. Yeah. I'm gonna insist on it, yeah. This is, um, this is half of this poem is um, a letter by Alvin to me. Um, and this is trying to be, uh, a day, it's, from, it's from a poem called Daykeeping, which is trying to be a poem about last, this past year, 2020, but God knows what's gonna happen really. So August, one poem of August in Daykeeping. And it's not necessarily finished, people. About this special money pack, my friend from Singapore wrote back, these gold silver papers for burning are also to be folded into pretend ingots like medieval Chinese currency. As children, we'd spend hours folding them for burning at the end of funeral wakes or during the seventh lunar month. That's a quotation. The seventh, the Asian seventh lunar month is the ghost month. Spirits walk and involve themselves with you much more than you want ever. You must be careful. Agnostic, at least you must know the taboos. You might decide to obey them too. Family ghosts and wanderer ghosts are at large. You'll need to feed them. If family, three meals a day. If wandering, unconnected, roaming, placate their suffering with an offering, a little plate in the corner outside the building so they may partially settle. But everyone I know is both wandering and housed, guest, host, jostled, mortal, lost and mapped, hard to be keen, adequate to this hap, what to offer and to whom, given these silver squares are also portals. That was it people, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to hear everybody really, really. And thanks Alvin. Fabulous, fabulous. See, told you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Now, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to read at all, but after hearing Rachel reading that and taking us home to Singapore, it's a nice loop. See, see what we did there. Um, I thought I would read a short one that is about the seventh month, ah, cool. uh, the Hungry Ghost Month. That comes. It's one of the other pieces that comes from my collaboration with George. So, if you indulge me for a minute uh, to close. I'll, I'll just go ahead and read that. So, seventh month in the seventh month, sprung from old bones and sky, a sun gray sameness bland enough for ghosts to come home, bearing hunger, bearing grudge and growl and drawn to tanki tableaus, pyric flourish of paper gold plied by perspiring progeny, wishing this stale year would end. Round and round the sandalwood again, ash the fragrance of ancestry, aloft, suit bound. Hellward bearing, akong ama ai atik, astride the etiolated tongues. Tuni bo lai, tuni bo nang lai pai pai. And, kam loi do mo yan le siu hong ge, and, walao e risen every anum like the untrimmed grass to tax living memory and the piety of face. Not the second coming, but the seventieth that drags 
has the descendantry looking askance at the toll each breath pays to an omnipresent past that asks and asks and does not answer. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on our little journey here around the world in Four Poets. And we've taken us around the loop. It's been great fun. I like to put together for uh, panels. I, I myself personally would love to listen to, and I certainly, you know, it was so wonderful to have the chance to, to read with and be with uh, my poet friends from around the world here. And thank you for listening. Um, over to you, Lit Palm, and thanks for having us. Please join me in thanking uh, Rachel, George, Marilyn, and Ranjit once again. Thank you, Alvin. That was that was an amazing curation. And thank you, uh, Rachel, Ranjit, George, and Mara as well. Uh, wonderful. Um, just a, a brief uh, look at what's coming. Um, next, uh, next Lip Balm in co collaboration with the New Orleans Poetry Festival is April 17, uh, which features the Dominican poets. Uh, Rina Espaillat, Jose Enrique del Monte, Soledad Alvarez, and Juan Matos with um, a special curational uh, activity from Susan Dickey. Um, and April 24, uh, also in, in collaboration with New Orleans Poetry Festival, we have what, what we call the Magic Show, which includes Dorian Law, uh, Andrew Duron, Bruce Bond, Hank Lazare, and Ruth Lepson. Please do join us for those shows. And of course, there will be many, many more to follow. Um, this is now, as I said, I think week 52. And so I'm going to hand it over to Cassandra um, back in Melbourne, Australia. I'm sorry? I think I've got the open mic names tonight. Oh, do you? do you? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, people have been writing me. Unless you want to do it, Cassandra. No, no, it's your week. I'm next week. All righty. So um, I'm going to move through the open mic quickly because we've had a full show, um, but we've had Edward Wells write in and Edward has prepared uh, a, a video element to their, um, their exhibit. So let me make Edward a co-host. Okay, Edward, you can now unmute yourself and share screen. I want to give a bit of context for these pieces. They're from a manuscript that I'm currently working on titled, I Feel Accident. I want to give a bit of context for these pieces. They're from a manuscript that I'm currently working on titled, I Feel Accident. This manuscript comes out of a tradition of found poetry. And so it involves the interlacing of lines from multiple existent texts. And this particular piece that I'm going to be reading first, Wooden Arms, is interlacing lines from two existent texts. The first being two little wooden shoes, and the second, the arm and the darkness. Glittered like tiny silver balls, the room contained a wooden cupboard leaning sideways and filled with mugs, jugs, and wooden arms. They turned away from the bed and from wooden arms. They rose and went to wooden arms out and looked. Three golden bowls, a long black wooden arm to them their old word as they talked. Their hand played with the wooden arm about them and feeling their flutter empty stone wall opposite them hung a huge wooden arm and turned cold as then when charlie finley had done they sank onto the wooden arm that linked 
its wooden arms close about their throat. They kissed, flesh pleasant, and their wooden arms stretched out piteously. Skirt was drawn high and knotted behind. They saw their wooden arms and lifted the curls. They flung themselves sprawling on the wooden arms, never more. Seems like we lost him, Jonathan. It does. Hey, sorry, them. I think from their Zoom name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe they'll, they'll call back um, in. Okay. That, that right, was so the complete piece. Oh, great. Oh, I okay. thought just because I saw some more coming up at the bottom with Dr. I didn't want to take up too much time. Fair call. All it right. Was well, thank you, Edward. Yeah, it was fascinating. Um, all right, let's move on to Loss. Is Loss still here? Yeah, there's Loss. Loss Glazier, am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, this one is called, is for the Nikwasi Mound, which is um, a mound here in uh, North Carolina. And Nikwasi means star. The townhouse mound, which dates from 1000 CE, was made of earth atop the grave of a prominent chief, along with sacred objects, including an eagle feather. <clears throat> Pristine draw, dawn inches palpably in clearly still blackness cold, heat fusion of atoms into stars. Place reflected in faint illumination across 93 billion light years to the present inching imminent place of your own star, merely a modest one at the edge, like showing up without warning at your own party, unexpected and unnoticed, but neither is the host found in attendance. That is your constant perch in natural worlds, the living creatures, birds, trees, Reptiles recognize you. In your place, their intelligence relies on perceiving facts instantly. From the darkness, a few cloud shapes become visible, rise in soft towers pointing overhead, illusion billows of smoky evaporations, pre-dawn grayish bulk. Separates, then gives way an empty blue dome of sky, pyretic search for more light, now a degree of illumination to the south, sea ridges turn back to obscure silhouette, a beautiful nightscape of ridge with fog swirls only visible to bats. This Antelucan dark, dawn will arrive before long, or perhaps in some years, at present, there is but a suggestion of form, or maybe it will take millennia. It pervades stars, star place on a reclined horizon, black, glittering with stars that overnight drop to earth in the long kalpas, a long duration of cosmic night in imperishable anticipation of the actual moment that already is. Thank you. Very cool. And Nick Wasi in, uh, in Cherokee is star place. <clears throat> Excellent. All right, let's go ahead and hear from Cindy Hockman. Cindy? Oh, you put me on the list? I didn't know I was on the list, but did, did I'm going to do a one -liner. I'll do a one liner that I probably read here, just like you, Jonathan. But no one will remember. Um, so it's a one-liner, and, and the intro is longer than the poem. Um, I'm a copy editor by trade. I'm also a big fan of Walt Whitman. He writes great poems, but they're a little too long. So I wrote a poem called Cliff Notes for Whitman's Song of Myself, or How to Pare Down 52 Stanzas into one. Grass, workmen, equality, yorp, 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 boot soles, 
Any questions? The end. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Very cool. All right, let's hear from Bob Heeman. Okay. Uh, information. Pursued by a man in a crocodile suit who doesn't know that he's not a crocodile, who has swallowed a man who still keeps running even after he has been swallowed. The sign says no exit, but is really the name of the company to which the exit leads. It is there his moment of illumination becomes permanent, even though he still does not know what it is. All thank right, you. Bob, thank you. And I think we have time to hear from Harvey Sauce before we close. Harvey? Am I unmuted yet? You are. Oh, okay, fine. Let me just bring the poem up. Okay, this is called, um, let me just move it over so I can see it. Comfort Woman, 1940-1945. I believe it's self-explanatory. What that grinning Japanese sergeant was doing to her needed no translation. Imperious as Hirohito, though naturally of considerably lower rank, he prized open her legs to claim her southernmost peninsula as if he owned it, taking her as Imperial Japan had been taking Koreans, particularly their women, since 1910. Just one among the countless soldiers and airmen who had ordered up a royal screw coming and going without so much as hello or goodbye. She never learned their names nor wanted to. When she closes her eyes at day's end, she tries to disremember their faces, those of the leering racially superior yellows who thrust themselves upon her invading her privacy, deprivatizing her privates once, twice, thrice, often as time allowed sharply as bayonets into a training post, so much so she feared their brand of yellow with nothing of the sun in it, despite the pestilential spread of their rising sun flag would rub off on her, in her, the penetrated, marking her as born to be used as yellow stars were said to have done for the Jews and others whose lives were deemed not to have mattered, whose foundational humanity was questioned by Axis interrogators. In this, the Germans and Japanese thought alike. Xenophobia, uber alles. Comfort woman, they called her, a misnomer in any language. Whose comfort was it anyway? Certainly not hers. Meat ungently tenderized on a mat not thick enough to qualify as a futon made sticky with the stuff of their insalubrious visitations, wiped off boys and men alike on what passed for her bed linens, a thin shift to both sleep under and wear. The dishonor of it all laying heavily upon her, her shame and unwanted comforter on a hot summer's night. No late day half-hearted apology from the Japanese government, however well-intentioned, can rid her of her unearned hair shirt of ill repute or exfoliate build up layers of threats and beatings. She suffered at their hands, endurance, biting her tongue till it bled so as not to give her captors any excuse to declare her passive resistance, impassive, mean, a capital offense, was her only permissible form of defense, that and her monthlies otherwise constrained to take the short, sharp shock of rape to avoid the chopping block. Lying there quietly in her mind, choking back groans and imprecations in Korean and what she had learned of Japanese, she built her own River Kwai bridge to nowhere, buried it under C4, bonsai it, set it ablaze, gave it the business like Alec Guinness never did, enduring what no one ever should have to endure having been used coarsely at 15 or 30 minutes intervals as one might a urinal, relieved shoulders, soldiers shaking off their last few drops on her and in her, laughing, chaffing as they jaunted out the door of the so-called comfort station to rape again, sing songing as they went, black sheep, black sheep, who will marry you knowing we have had you their truth, her 
truth. What cotton-mouthed fool said truth will set you free? Her body, once a freshly risen Xanadu of womanhood, long since pounded by misuse into flatbread, no one seeking sustenance of a wife will have complaints of arthritis. That spinsterhood has become her lot in life, dishonored and discomforted. At times unbidden, she will recall a derisive bow one bemedaled soldier, nameless if not entirely faceless, gave her after getting himself off before, as luck would have it, being himself bayoneted in February of 1943, when the Americans at some considerable sacrifice took Guadalcanal. That lingering, can't shake it, japing look of satisfaction on his jaundice yellow mug after a particularly mean fuck mocking her even now. How she would have loved to have been that GI, putting her whole weight into it, the full weight of the, of the Korean Peninsula, North and South, puzzlement turning to recognition on her tormentor's face as the bayonet sunk in. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Bill, would you like to say what's coming up next for the New Orleans Poetry Festival as we close? Not sure if Bill is actually there. Thanks. Bill Lavender uh, helps run the New Orleans Poetry Fest. He and Megan Byrne run it. And yeah, it looks like he's stepped away. So I guess that's our show. It is. It is almost, almost. Just want to remind you again, we have uh, April 17, that's next Saturday, uh, the Dominican Poets. Um, and April 24, the Saturday after that, um, a magic show. So please, please do join us. And to close, maybe to raise spirits a tiny bit, um, I'm gonna read a poem uh, by Erica Burkhart, translated from the German um, by myself. It's called Out of Sleep. Out of sleep, poem, take with you a knowledge as it appears in fallow grasses in the twilight of the hours between open to words that do not comprehend. It remains concealed, blinding and gloomy, withdraws back into the root. Very distant acquaintances from years, dates unknown, seldom friends, never the mother, stand around in a dream, its edges tattered, guardians of the forgetting until they are forgotten themselves. To rescue, Fragments of images from the dark chambers of hypnotic sleep, under and overexposed from the white book of our presence over the chasm. The end of the chasm is never visible. And so I thank you all for joining us on this wonderful 52nd lip balm and hope to see you at the 53rd. Peace, love, harmony, and more love. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.